This is something a little different. This is the Link Station N1. This is intended to be an all SSD NAS. Not even 10 years ago, an all SSD NAS was unthinkable. But SSD technology has progressed to the point where not only is an all SSD NAS feasible, but it lasts almost as long as an all hard drive based NAS. This is my actual first experience with an all SSD NAS. Link Tech Plus was gracious enough to send this over to me for review. No money has exchanged hands and they're not seeing this video before I publish it. That said, if you do like this video or any other video I've made, please like, subscribe, and share with all of your friends. Spreading the good gospel of high-tech lowlife will let the YouTube algorithm know that I'm doing well. The idea behind these NASs are very simple. It's got two slots for SATA SSDs and four slots for NVMe SSDs. In addition to that, it's got a Type-C port in the front, as well as a 3.5mm headphone jack, HDMI, two USB 3.0s, 2.5 gigabit, and a DC jack. It does have quite a bit of I.O. for a NAS, though ultimately, you're probably just going to use Ethernet and the power jack. You can get a display out using HDMI, but the device is set up to where you can just plug it into power, plug it into your router or network switch, and then just access it through a web browser through any other device. So yes, out of the box, you won't need to plug it into a display, but you may need to plug it into a display in the future if, say, you wanted to install a different OS. So arguably the most important spec here is the Ethernet port. This is a 2.5 gigabit Ethernet port. A lot of the higher end NASs have 10 gigabit, but most houses aren't equipped with 10 gigabit. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that most houses aren't equipped with 2.5 gigabit in mind. In fact, my own house isn't equipped with 2.5 gigabit. Like for example, my own desktop is limited to gigabit speeds at best from an Ethernet port. I find that having one gigabit around my house is more than enough for my use case. We'll talk more about performance specifics later, but I just wanted to say that if you have gigabit in your house at least, then you'll be fine with it. But if you're someone that has 10 gigabit wired around your house, then there are faster NASs if needed. But in terms of gigabit speed, I think it has plenty of speed for most people. It's also a good opportunity to talk about drive speeds. So these are SATA SSDs, and so while they're not as fast as NVMe drives, they're still plenty fast. But of course, sticking in some SSDs and accessing through the network, it complicates things. All of this really hinges on having capable network hardware. My main desktop has gigabit ethernet. And of course, as you can see here, I've benchmarked three different types of drives. The NAS, a SATA SSD in my computer, and an NVMe SSD in my computer. This NAS caps out a 2.5 gigabit ethernet. If I had 2.5 gigabit around the house, and if my main desktop was equipped with 2.5 gigabit ethernet, then I'd probably see much better results from the NAS. But the NAS itself isn't hamstrung in performance. I ran a benchmarking utility directly on the NAS, and what I found was that my SATA SSDs were basically performing as expected undeniable proof that networking gear makes a big difference if you want to use a NAS. Still though, in my experience of using the NAS, which by the way I'll get into a couple of use cases, I honestly haven't had many if any issues with the speed. I can just access everything in real time as if it were just a drive attached to my computer. So yes, fair warning, if you want a NAS, you'll need decent networking gear. You'll need decent networking around the house. Install your SATA SSDs, your 2.5 inch SATA drives, it's pretty simple. You just pull the caddy out, and then put the SSDs in, you line up the screw holes, you screw it in from the bottom, and then you insert it in. It'll only go in one way, but honestly, when I pushed it in, I was scared for my life. I thought that maybe I broke my SSD or something, but no, it's just a loud sound that it makes. A very loud snapping sound. Do not be alarmed, it just means it went in properly. Installing any NVMe SSDs is a toolless affair though, but as of right now, I don't have any spare NVMe drives that aren't being used. So once that's done, you just plug it into power and then plug it in directly to your router or to your network switch. And once you do that, you press the power button and it just turns on. Admittedly, I don't know how long it takes for the device to take into effect, I kind of just plugged it in and walked away and did something else for a little bit, but it should be up within like a couple of minutes or so. Anyways, when the server is ready, you should be able to access it by going to tower.local. And here you have access to an operating system only known as Unraid. Now admittedly, I've never used Unraid before, but I do have some experience with similar hypervisor OSs such as Proxmox. It's to my understanding that there's an internal USB drive in here that hosts Unraid. In theory, if you wanted to, you could wipe it and then potentially run TrueNAS off of this. But for the purposes of this video, we're not going to do that. Besides, I figured it'd be a good opportunity to try TrueNAS for myself. I mean, this is normally a paid product. And yes, as confirmed by a different content creator, you have a true genuine license key to Unraid Basic. And honestly, you only really need Unraid Basic because 
well, this device only supports up to 6 different drives, 4 NVMe SSDs and 2 SATA SSDs. We should also talk about the rest of the specs. This device is powered by the Intel Celeron N5105. Now I will admit, it's been a very long time since I used a Celeron PC, and every single Celeron PC I've ever touched I've hated. But in a NAS, it works surprisingly well. So much so that it makes me question if I even need my big server downstairs. Spoiler alert, I'll still need it for other things. But for the purposes of being a file server and a media server, it works pretty well. But more on specific use cases during the OS section. It also rocks 16GB of DDR4 memory. NAS compares did the hard work of disassembling the device, and what they found out was that the RAM was in fact soldered onto the memory, so no, you can't upgrade the RAM if needed. But for a small home server that hopefully no one else but your household will be able to use, I think 16 gigs is fine. It's also passively cooled, meaning that there's no fans, so it'll never get loud. In fact, I put it under my TV and when I'm watching it, it doesn't make any noise whatsoever, which is awesome. So the hardware is pretty cool, but what about the software? What about Unraid? So now let's talk Unraid, because Unraid is ultimately uncharted territory for myself. Unraid is a Linux-based operating system that's said to be proprietary. Unraid is typically paid software, and the starter license is about $50 per license. Yes, if you do have a bigger server with more drive slots, then you will need to pay for a higher tier version of Unraid, but for this device, you won't need to upgrade your Unraid license. To do anything Unraid related, you will need to start up an array. If you have multiple drives in your Unraid device, you would essentially assign each disk to a task. As shown before, I have two crucial 2TB BX500 drives that I just have lying around. With just two drives, I only really have two different configurations. One configuration where I have both drives set to disks and then I use 4TB of total storage. Which, yes, is great for total storage, but if one drive fails, then you lose all of your data. But in this case, I opted for the more safe option, one drive as the data drive and the other drive as a sort of backup drive. In my current use case, I assigned one disk as disk 1 and the other as parity. But of course, if you have multiple disks, then you have more than one option. Just remember, if you want parity on your drives, you need to have a parity drive that's as big or bigger than the drive array itself. Future high tech low life here, it seems like in my infinite wisdom I forgot to showcase how to format a drive in case you put a brand new drive into Unraid. If you want my personal opinion, I would recommend just reading the documentation. Unraid has documentation on their official website. Unraid does give your server a couple of features. For example, you can turn it into a NAS. Yes, you can set up Docker containers. You can also set up virtual machines as well, and even download plugins for Unraid. The virtual machine functionality is fairly powerful. In fact, Unraid was famously used in Linus Tech Tips of various 2 Gamers 1 PC builds. Now to be honest, I wouldn't use this NAS for virtual machines, there just isn't enough resources for me to use virtual machines comfortably. But as a dedicated docker machine that runs all of my docker containers like Jellyfin and Deluge and Sonar and Radar, it's good stuff. But as a transcoding media server on a budget? It's great. If you're someone like me, then you know how bad Celerons used to be. The names Intel Atom and Intel Celeron really leave a bad taste in my mouth. And yes, it took a little bit to figure out how to enable my Intel graphics in Unraid, and it took even longer to figure out how to bring over those Intel graphics over to Jellyfin to then ultimately enable Intel QuickSync. But my god, it works. My 4K transcoding dreams have come true. Now granted, at the end of the day, this is still a Celeron processor, so don't expect to do like more than two 4K streams. But you can do plenty of 1080p streams. But I will say, your device will not be able to transcode out of the box without some modifications to the operating system. Yes, this involves changing some kernel parameters as well as passing your GPU over to a Docker container or a VM or whatever. Now granted, this might not be the easiest process in the world. Given that this is my own first rodeo with Unraid, I recommend watching someone else for Unraid tutorials. Space Invader 1 is my choice of Unraid tutorials. There are free operating systems like True NAS and Proxmox that do the same thing Unraid does. But one advantage that Unraid has over those other operating systems is that it works well for JBOD setups. Like you could put in different drives with different capacities inside your machines and Unraid should still work as an array. If you want to use parity features, your one parity drive has to be as large or larger than the entire array. But of course, best practice dictates that you should use the same drives, or at least the same capacity drives. And given that I'm not serving this out to other people outside of my own household, 
or even the whole internet as a whole, my stuff really shouldn't be hammered that much. It'll probably last as long as it would normally in my own PC. So how does it function as a file server? Well, it functions as well as you think it does. You would just need to enable SMB on Unraid. And of course, there is one additional use for a NAS, especially for content creators such as I. That's right, storing footage and other stuff. In fact, you can actually edit off of a NAS. In fact, that's what I've been doing this entire video. Yes, video footage for this video, as well as some other future video projects, are stored on this NAS, and I've been editing off them. Yes, at some point, I will have to buy more drives to stick into my NAS, but I think I'll do that after this video. So, this device is a very solid piece of kit. It's small, but powerful enough to serve as a small home media server for yourself. And while I wouldn't want to take it outside of my own house, you could feasibly do it and then use it portably. Now, I don't know if you can plug this in directly to your PC via Type-C or by Ethernet or whatever, but I mean, you can bring a portable network switch and like two Ethernet cables and just work that way. I do think Unraid is easy to use, but I also have some experience with server OSs. I do think Unraid is a lot easier to use than, say, Proxmox, but I also think for bigger businesses and whatnot, I think TrueNAS is a better choice overall. And for a home file server and a home media server, I think Unraid is really good. With a lot of tutorials on the internet, there's a lot you can set up. It just requires a little bit of imagination and knowing what you want to do with your file server. In my case, I've opted to turn it into a media server, as well as a file server where I edit my videos off of. And for those purposes, this NAS is pretty good. This is the part where I talk about the price. The price is normally $4.99, but it's on sale right now for $3.99. Is it expensive? I mean, yeah, kind of, but NASs are kind of already expensive as it is. The sale price is actually lower than any other all-SSD NAS that I've seen. Yes, of course, the price can skyrocket, especially if you have to buy additional drives, especially high-capacity drives. But this can save you a pretty penny, especially if you're paying a lot for Google Drive or, say, iCloud or whatever. You will need to set up some kind of backup protocol by yourself, as I have not done so myself, but it's possible to set up something like Nextcloud, where you can just sync all of your photos directly to your cloud server. Yes, even when you're away from home. So is this all SSD NAS worth a consideration? Honestly, I think it is. It's small and compact enough to fit even in your living room. It also doesn't make too much noise given that there's no moving hard drives in there. But if I had to be honest with you, I think all houses should have a NAS of some sort, whether it's this or something from Synology or whatever. But if you're willing to take the time to actually learn and spend a couple of dollars on some SSDs, you have a potent solution for a file server. One that's surprisingly powerful despite its form factor, and one that's not too loud either. If you like this video, please press the like button and check out our other videos. And if you like those other videos as well, be sure to press the subscribe button and share the good gospel of high-tech lowlife with your friends. Furthermore, we have a community discord for enlightened individuals such as you. And if you wish to further support high-tech lowlife, be sure to check out our Patreon page. Links in the description.